So what are all of these different types of hybrid and electric vehicle, like a series hybrid, a parallel hybrid, a fuel cell hybrid, and an ICE? Well, I'm going to explain all of that in this video and, and explain why these four vehicles have got different powertrains compared to these four, and then answer the big question, does it really matter? So we're going to start with the most common vehicle on the road at the moment, which is the ICE, or internal combustion engine, which is petrol or diesel, as distinct to an external combustion engine, which is typically something like a steam train. So to explain how it works, we're going to use this schematic of a vehicle. It doesn't really matter whether that's the front wheels or the back wheels, but we're going to be driving this set of wheels. So the motor is going to be turning those wheels. And for that, we're going to put this shaft in here. We're going to have this motor, this ice engine, petrol or diesel, turning that shaft, which turns uh, through those cogs, that shaft and the wheels go around, and we need an energy source for it, so we're going to have a fuel tank, and we're going to have an arrow going from the fuel tank to the motor. And the only way to re-energize that vehicle is to use a petrol or diesel bowser, so that's your ICE, your most basic vehicle. Then we're going to move across to the BEV, or battery electric vehicle, which is what most people think of an EV, but in fact there's many types of EV, and a BEV is one that they're thinking of. So that's purely a vehicle which is only powered by its battery. And if we put the schematic in again, we're going to put an electric motor in place of the ICE engine, we're going to put a battery there, and we're going to have an arrow between the motor and the battery, but the difference is the arrow is going to be bi-directional. Now why is that? The reason is that most of the time the battery is going to power that electric motor which turns the wheels and off you go but when you're coming down a hill or when the vehicle is slowing down then this motor turns into a generator and it actually generates electricity which charges the battery and so if you're at the top of the hill by the time you come down to the bottom of the hill you can actually end up with more charge in the battery than when you started which then gives rise to a myth that if you drive your EV up and down hills you'll actually extend the range of it. That is not true. I can see why people come to that conclusion, but it's not true. And I have a specialist video where I explain why that's not true and why you might think that it is. So that's called a regen when the uh, motor turns into a generator and charges the battery. Now, the only energy source, uh, only way to replenish energy aside from regen is to externally charge that battery, which you'd do maybe at home or in a public charger or something like, like that. Then we've got a HEV, which is a hybrid electric vehicle. And again, we've got our schematic here. Um, we've again, we've got a prop shaft, and this time the uh, ICE engine makes a reappearance, um, and we're going to connect it up to the fuel tank just as we did before. But this time we also add a relatively small electric motor which goes on the prop shaft as well and can help turn the, uh, those wheels. We also have a small battery, much smaller than the one we had in the BEV, and we connect that up in exactly the same way that we did with the BEV as well, so we get regen when the vehicle is slowing down. Um, but also, we now connect that battery to the internal combustion engine now. I should mention here that I'm just leaving aside details called like um, generators, but you can think of the ICE as just sort of directly powering the battery. And then uh, the external power source for that is only going to be a petrol or diesel bowser. Now how does this work? The answer is it's complex and quite clever. So the wheels can be turned purely by the internal combustion engine or purely by the electric motor and the battery, or a combination of both at the same time. And the ICE engine can either generate electricity to charge the battery, or it can turn uh, the wheels, or it can do both at the same time. And that sounds complicated, and it is, Hybrids tend to have displays that you can look at where you can see all this magic going on. You as the driver don't need to know anything about it. Uh, it will just happen automatically. But you, if you listen carefully, you can hear the ice engine cutting in and out. And if you're crawling around in a car park, typically, uh, 
HEV will do that without any use of its ice engine, but once you start to get above 50, 60 k's an hour, then the um, ice engine will cut in. And for maximum acceleration, both of them can work at the same time. So there's quite a lot of complexity going on, but you don't need to worry about any of that. Now the range you're going to get purely in electric mode is maybe four or five k's, not much, because really the electric system is there to help the ice engine. It's not there to take it over, it's just there to pretty much assist it. Then we come into a PHEV or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and that is similar again. We're going to start with our schematic. There's our prop shaft. We're going to have that familiar ice engine and the fuel tank and but this time we're going to have a bigger electric motor and the reason is that motor's got more work to do. We're also going to have a bigger battery as well and we connect it up in the same way as we did with the HEV. Now the difference here is that we've got two energy sources. Uh, so we can put fuel into our tank over here, but we can also plug in uh, the vehicle to uh, electrical charger, same way we did with the BEV, and hence its name, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Now there's another difference with hybrid electric with, with PHEVs as well, and that is how well they perform on electric only. Remember I said to have you really it's just for slow speed and assisting the ice engine? Well here you've got two separate power plants. So PHEVs can typically drive for maybe 80, 150 kilometers on pure electric range. You won't get that out of a HEV at all. Um, and also uh, th th essentially the electric system is designed to work in conjunction with, but also separately from the eye system as well. And you do get both um, motors turning the wheels at the same time, so they can um, perform pretty well, but they are more expensive than HEVs. So these are what we call parallel hybrids. And the reason they're called parallel hybrids is because both motors, the ICE and the electric motor, can turn the wheels at the same time and they use the same mechanism to do it. Now we come on to something called the series hybrids and this is what they look like. We're going to start with the HEV version, there's a PHEV version. So here's our schematic again and we've got an electric motor um, and we've got our ICE engine and then we've got a small battery and what we're going to do is connect um, that uh, ice engine up to the battery so again it's uh, going really going via generator but think of it just directly powering the motor again to the battery and again we've got that regen going from the electric motor to the battery um, and we're going to put a fuel tank in as well so what do you notice is the difference well there's no way that this ice engine can turn the wheels directly and whereas with the parallel hybrids, it can, and that is the difference between a parallel hybrid and a series hybrid. A series hybrid is only driven by the electric motors, even if the electricity might be generated to some extent by, um, the, by the ICE engine. So energy source for that, just the petrol barrier. So as well, there's no way to be able to plug that um, battery in. The only way that battery can get charged is similar to this one is either by regen or it is charged directly off the ICE engine. So then we come into the PHEV and you probably guess what this one's going to be like. So again, we've got our ICE engine, um, we've got a large electric motor, we've got a larger battery, the same way um, we, we have in that one. We connect all of that together and we find um, that, yes, we've got two energy sources there. So the battery is bigger, same way it is in that PHEV, and so we can charge that directly. Um, and but in, in both cases here we have the electric motor doing all of the driving and the ice engine is only there to generate electricity not to do any driving of the wheels. So then we come into an EREV which is extended range electric vehicle there's other names for that as well but um, that's what I'm going to use in this example. Again there's our schematic we've got a large electric motor um, and we're going to put a large battery on it same sort of size as the BEV um, but what we're going to do we're going to have a tiny little ice engine there we're going to have a little fuel tank and that's going to connect up. Now the difference with the extended range is that we uh, there's no way for the ice engine to do anything else other than charge the battery. It isn't going to drive the wheels, it's not going to directly um, provide electricity to the motor, it's really just there to provide additional electricity into that, um, that big battery. So it's kind of exactly the same as a BEV but sort of carrying around a generator um, on board. 
Then we've come to an FCEV, which is a fuel cell electric vehicle. And again, with the schematic, uh, we start off with another electric motor, so nothing unusual this time. But this is where it starts to get interesting because it goes out to a fuel cell um, system over here, a hydrogen tank, and our external source is um, hydrogen. So what we have over here is a hydrogen system which generates electricity in not dissimilar way to the ice engines over here and as it generates electricity then it can either power that electric motor directly or it can power that battery um, or recharge um, that battery. Now it tends not to do a huge amount of that because the battery is mainly there for regenerative purposes when the vehicle slows down you may as well harvest that energy that's why the battery is relatively small. Now out of all of that, um, all of these are hybrid electric vehicles. Some would say that the fuel cell isn't a hybrid electric vehicle. I think it is because it can run on battery power assisted in the same way that a HEV is as well. And you might say, well, hang on, isn't a PHEV a HEV? Yes, it is, but it's, we kind of need another name for HEVs here. And in fact, there are many different names for all of these. And there's sort of even more variants that, that I haven't covered and combinations, etc. And I have simplified this um, a fair bit, but nevertheless, it should give you a fairly good idea as to some of the technology which is being talked about with modern vehicle drivetrains. So now we've understood that, we, let's go through some examples and then see what it actually means to you as a buyer. Okay, so let's take a look at some of um, what that looks like in practice. This is a Range Rover Sport parallel plug-in hybrid and what we have over here is at the back we have a battery and unfortunately the battery has meant that the spare wheel has to be deleted not ideal on a four-wheel drive but that's the problem you get there's a lot of stuff to fit in a hybrid vehicle so you tend to run out of space and things like spares um, often get deleted the electric motor lives underneath here and it's a parallel one so we've got the uh, ice engine over here which turns this shaft going to the back and there's another one you can't really see there. The electric motor sits there and helps turn that shaft because it is a parallel um, plug-in electric hybrid. Now let's contrast that to a series hybrid. This is the BYD Shark and over here we've got um, a smallish petrol engine and we've got a large battery pack, uh, 30 kilowatt hours and that's nice low and central. Uh, we have an electric motor in the front over there and we have an electric motor in the back and the two are coordinated by software which is what I mean when I talk about a software drivetrain. So we've also got a 60 litre fuel tank here and it's interesting to see that 60 litre fuel tank is much much smaller than the 30 kilowatt hour battery but the 60 litre fuel tank will take you a long way and that starts to speak to some of the limitations around battery electric vehicles. You have to have very large heavy bulky batteries to get the equivalent range and energy out of a um, petrol or diesel. Then we've got a BEV, uh, this is a battery electric vehicle and you can see here we've got just a massive battery, basically the um, bottom of the car is just purely battery and then we've got a rear electric motor and we've got a front electric motor. Now this is a Tesla Model S, not all cars have dual motors, one at the back, one at the front. If they only want to drive let's say the front wheels which is quite common then uh, you only have a motor at the front, no motor at the back. So I'll go through the uh, differences between all-wheel drive and front-wheel drive another time. I do have a video where I explain that generically but not in the context of EVs. All right, so let's go through these eight vehicles then and um, explain what they are. So the BYD Shark 6, that's a series PHEV, but I put an asterisk there because in some circumstances the front wheels can directly drive, uh, directly be driven by the petrol engine, so some people say it's not, but conceptually you can think of it as a series PHEV. The Ranger PHEV, that's a parallel PHEV, similar to the, rain, to the Range Rover I showed you. The Nissan X-Trail e-Power and the Qashqai, that's really interesting because those are series hybrids, so their petrol engines never drive the wheels directly, they're just there to generate electricity. And um, I don't know if many extra owners know that, but when they do know that, they tend to tell everyone because it is kind of cool. Um, Toyota Mirai, that's a fuel cell electric vehicle. You don't see many of those around. The RAV4, very, very popular. That's a uh, parallel hybrid now. You can only buy them as hybrids. The Depower S07, that's an extended range electric vehicle, quite rare. All Teslas are pure battery electric vehicles. Tesla doesn't do any form of hybrid whatsoever and the Kona is available from Hyundai as an electric vehicle, uh, an ICE vehicle and a hybrid so you've got an absolute choice. 
So remember that not all EVs are city SUVs. Um, so things like the Ford F-150 that's available in Australia, I've toe tested it, that is a pure electric vehicle of BEV. The Ferrari SF90, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, Ford Transit, that's a um, electric vehicle Kia EV9 tows two and a half tons and it's a seven seater that's a battery electric vehicle Hyundai Ionic N that's a sports car battery electric vehicle and the Rolls Royce Spectre at the high end also a battery electric vehicle but those tend to be exceptions most of the EVs tend to be road cars at this point so which one should you choose and why does it matter so some generalized statements here first one is that a battery electric vehicle makes sense if three conditions are met. Uh, one, you've got a vehicle available, so if you want a four-wheel drive or a Ranger equivalent or Hilux or something like that, there isn't an equivalent of that on the Australian market at the moment. Or if you want a people mover or a small, cheap sports car, those, those things simply do not exist. The buy price on electric vehicles tends to be higher. It is coming down, um, but what you can do is offset that higher buy price with much, much lower running costs. So if that works out for you economically, then um, that, that's the second point. And the third one is charging isn't a problem. So if you can charge it um, in your garage off street, that's great. If you have to charge it, if you don't um, can't park it on your own property, you've got to park it in the street, there are increasing solutions to that as well, um, but possibly maybe you're going out into rural areas where there's fewer charges. So I think BEVs should make sense if the type of vehicle you want is available, economically it's going to work out for you and then you, you can find out some way to charge it. And all of those problems becoming less and less of an issue as time goes on. Now hybrids are the new normal and if you're buying something like a city SUV runabout or a road car there's really no disadvantage to having a hybrid and that's why Toyota have discontinued all of their non-hybrid vehicles Camry, RAV4, Corolla only available as hybrids. Um, the only ones only non-hybrid Toyotas are the four-wheel drive range and the sports car range like the Supra and the 86. But when we get into things like four-wheel drives and commercials, we tend to see fewer of those vehicles because they've got disadvantages, they tend to be heavy, tend to have those packaging problems where you've got to put a battery in there and an electric vehicle, uh, electric motor, and that's just a lot of space taken up which you really want for other points there. So they do exist um, and uh, that's where hybrids are. Now parallel or series really don't worry about that. Um, you can d delve into the technicalities but just look at what you want to do. How much do you want to spend? What do you need the vehicle to do? What are your running costs likely to be? And don't worry too much about whether it's a parallel or a series. PHEV, that does make sense. Um, under two conditions. One, if you can plug into cheap electricity and B, if you do enough short trips. So if you buy a PHEV and you never plug it in, well that's kind of a waste of money really. Or when you do plug it in, if the um, electricity uh, prices to do so are very, very high, that is not really going to save you much money. Where, and, and if you, So the best case for PHEV is where you do quite a lot of short trips and you can plug in maybe at home or at your business and get very cheap electricity and then you certainly will start to see some savings. But remember PHEVs um, do have a higher buy price as well. Uh, E-Rev, very rare being overtaken by EVs. Um, the only reason you have an E-Rev is to extend the range, but with battery technology getting better, aerodynamics improving, etc., um, there's less and less need for them. Hydrogen, I don't think is ever going to be an alternative. Why would you buy a hydrogen vehicle? We don't have the infrastructure for it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, we don't have the filling stations. EVs can pretty much do the job for a lot of this stuff now. The exception to that, I think, would be commercial heavy duty vehicles. So. Um, that's the option. Uh, now, all-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive. I haven't covered this. I will do another video um, on that in the context um, of EVs. In the meantime, watch my other explanation on it. And that is definitely going to be a purchase decision more so than whether it's parallel or series, I would suggest. So essentially what you want to do when you're choosing your vehicle is not really so much look at the drivetrain. Look at what the vehicle can actually do for you. Uh, what's its payload, what's its towing capacity, how many people can it seat, what's its operating cost, what does it feel like to drive, etc. Those are really the important points here as opposed to how it achieves that. So I think, hope you found this video useful. Any questions please drop them in the comments and thank you for watching.